Um, this is our first culinary demo from the In Harvest team of Mike, Michael Holloman and Colleen Donnelly. Um, they're both uh, originally restaurant chefs, and uh, Michael has been uh, joined um, In Harvest, and he's been um, going around the country teaching. Uh, he's also the, uh, ad the chair of the Whole Grains Council of Culinary Advisors. Um, Colleen has found her true love in school food, and today they're um, both spending their time crisscrossing the country, showing schools, restaurants, and workplaces. You saw um, in Harvest with Anne, um, in workplace dining options, how to maximize the possibilities of whole grains. So today they're sharing some tips, and they're also going to do a demo of shaker salads, multi-grain yogurt parfaits, and spicy barley bowls, which we'll get to enjoy at the reception. And um, we're starting to hand out um, recipe. Um, so you'll be able to follow along with Michael and Colleen. But please bring these uh, handouts back tomorrow because we'll be having five more demos tomorrow, and you'll want to follow along. So thank you very much, and um, looking forward to this. Yeah, um, Caroline and Ashley are coming with recipe demo handouts. I know the first couple things they're going to be showing you, we don't have a recipe for because we aren't going to be tasting them. You're just going to be imagining them. But um, the last dish they're making, their barley bowls, you will be able to follow along with the recipe, and then we will be sampling that in the reception that follows. And hang on to these handouts that you're getting now because they have all the recipes for tomorrow, too. So you want to keep that to follow along, take any notes so that you can try these dishes when you get back to the real world. Thank you. All right. Are we on? Hello. Can you hear yes. me? Hello. We, uh, we made sure that neither of us got Ann Cooper's um, lapel microphone, so they said they took that out of rotation now. And, and I want some of that cold medicine she's taking. <laughs> she was on fire, even, even as sick as she felt. And I, I've known Ann for a long time, and she doesn't feel good. So uh, we just found out that we'll actually be able to have um, what Colleen's doing on camera. So we had a few um, what Cindy referred to as food porn shots that um, we put up here. And, uh, and, you know, everyone's had those for the first two presentations, so um, we can refer back to these. But these are some of the unique presentations that um, we're finding to be successful with, with whole grains. Uh, you can see the puffed, puffed rice crisps. Um, breakfast salads, we're starting to do a lot with breakfast salads, but combining grains and greens. Um, our PR guy had told me, Oh, about three years ago, you really need to be doing breakfast salads. They're, they're going to be the thing. And I, I kept kind of, I don't know, fighting it a little bit. And then um, Colleen and I actually had the opportunity to do a food show in Paris called Ciel. And we went out the first morning before we hit the market to shop. And I ordered an omelet, and it came with a breakfast salad. So that was, uh, that was all it took. Um, you pretty much set up at this point? Pretty much. All right, so the new frontier, food service, um, doesn't feel very new to me. I've been doing this for uh, 21 years now. Whole grains have been my life every single day. You'd think that that would get boring, uh, but I can say to this day, I love it as much today, if not more than the day I started. And the great thing about it is, is that we cover all different segments, you know, from food service to retail, but they're all um, a little bit different from each other, but they all come down to the same message in the end. And I think as we started to talk about 
um, with Cindy in advance, you know, kind of formulating what we were going to talk about up here, we talked about that, well, number one, so um, nine years ago, I was the only chef at In Harvest, and I've been saying for years, it's, it's happening this year, is when it going to be the ramp up of whole grains, and, and every year it'd be like, it'd move a little bit on the dial, and then all of a sudden, it exploded, and we have four chefs on staff now, including Colleen, and um, I wanted to say that I actually met Colleen through Anne, and it was six years ago that we were at a conference, and I said, Anne, we're starting to sell whole grains into schools, and I, we don't know what we're doing, and the guidelines are changing, and I really don't want to do this unless we do it right. And, and I asked her about consulting for us, and she said, it's going to be a conflict of interest because I've used your, whole, your grains for years, and I want to continue to use them in the school, so let me introduce you to a friend. And uh, Colleen consulted for a couple years, and now she's been full-time with us, but even though K-12 is your passion, I mean, you're a CIA-trained chef, had your own restaurant, she does really high-end stuff, and what I love is she's able to take flavors um, into school food that you never would have thought would have been there. Um, I think we would probably, probably switch over to the camera at this point. Um, there we go. Okay. So we have three recipes, and we're going to kind of, as we go through this, I think we have a little over 20 minutes before we're supposed to take questions, so this is going to go pretty rapidly. Um, and as you can probably tell already, I don't shut up very easily. So uh, I'll talk, I promise. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so why don't we start with the first recipe and yep. talk about what we're doing. So the, the first recipe, Mike sort of alluded to the fact that I, my passion is K-12, but I come from a fine dining background and a home cook background. So I'm sort of, I'm a little bit of everything. Um, nothing uh, is as satisfying or as um, gratifying as cooking for kids. So when I was asked to uh, help in Harvest bring whole grains into the school lunch program across the country, I was, I was thrilled and delighted. And, and some, of the, some of the concepts had already been developed by in Harvest, but some I'm proud to say that I came up with. Um, and and we, sort of, we sort of tweaked them for different, uh, for different day parts and for different um, segments. This first one was, I believe, um, a contract feeder recipe using a um, multi-grain, quick cooking, there's, where's Maria? Quick cooking um, blend of bulgur and um, uh, flaxseed and colossary red rice and help me out, quinoa flakes, flakes, buckwheat groats. Buckwheat groats. So really all you do, and here's the, um, I'm trying to get it so you can see this. I'm not sure if that's going to work, but... Um, this has been soaked in hot milk. That's it. Um, it gives it a, a creamy flavor and texture, and um, we're going to layer it with um, some other ingredients. Uh, this, this is very simple for schools to do. Mix the, the soaked grain with yogurt and layer it with the, the, the proper amount of fruits, and you have a reimbursable meal. Um, we, of, of course, don't ever stop there, and we... I just came up with a couple of new recipes because um, that's what we do. Uh, and it, so we're, we're making our own flavored yogurt and, and adding some, actually even some more whole grains to this. So I'm just going to quickly make one. This is Greek yogurt. So let's talk about trends. Yogurt parfaits are a huge trend, right? You can't go anywhere and not see a yogurt parfait. They're on buffets. They're at Starbucks. They're, they're everywhere. They're in schools. They're all over the place. And they're great. And it's for good reason. They're great. Um, Greek yogurt. Has anybody not heard of Greek yogurt? Raise your hand, because you've been under a rock. It's, it's, it's just, it's a huge, huge trend right now. So um, they're starting to come up with flavored ones, but I thought, well, I can't really find a, a lemon Greek yogurt with vanilla flavor in it, so I'm going to make one. Um, this is vanilla yogurt, Greek yogurt. This is lemon juice and lemon zest. I'm going to mix them together. There, I just made my own yogurt without having to put it in a controlled environment for a long time. It was easy. Um, you can make peanut butter yogurt and layer it with chocolate if you want to get, um, you know, hit somebody's sweet spot. <clears throat> so I made yogurt. Now I'm going to put a little bit of, and you're going to use any glass. If, the, if you were serving this on a nice buffet or as a part of a, you know, a starter for a, a lovely breakfast, you would, you would pick a nice clear glass like this. If it's a grab and go, obviously it's going to go in plastic hopefully compostable plastic, but. 
So I'm just putting a little bit of the, of the grain on the bottom. So that's the surprise when you get to the bottom. And then I'm going to top that with some blueberries. These are just fresh blueberries. They could be, they could be frozen. Then it would give it a sort of a syrupy quality when, it, when, they, um, when they melt. This can be any fruit. I call this my lemon blueberry chiffon because I wanted it to, um, to, to sort of be reminiscent of a pie. And I'm putting the nice, beautiful consistency of, that, of the Greek yogurt on top. And I'm topping it with a crunchy topping that I made. And this is, this is the, the um, interesting, what be, makes it even more interesting. This is puffed wild rice, puffed brown rice. Um, there could be puffed quinoa in here, any, any um, whole grain that puffs would be delicious. Um, and I've mixed it with a little brown rice syrup and graham cracker crumbs and walnuts. So it's kind of like the crust, so it's like deconstructed lemon chiffon pie with blueberries in it. And lots of whole grains. And it's very beautiful. And I've gotten it all over the table. And it's super fun to eat. So marketing whole grains in food service, that's, that's why we're here, is to talk about that. And we talk about all the different segments that, um, that we work with, and K-12 certainly is, we're both passionate about K-12, um, but I started thinking about what was the common element among everything, all the segments that we work with, and we talk about, in our culinary team, it's about education. And once you educate them and they understand it, it sells itself, kind of. But it's not really about asking for the order at the end of the day. Um, we, th we talk about, when we go into, like, both belong to the Chef's Move to School program, so I cook in our own district. We have nine schools. I'm in there one school a month. And when I go in, um, thankfully, I have her recipes that are already, you know, plug and play for a reimbursable meal, but go in and I cook with Colleen's recipes, but I work with the staff, the, the cooks at the school, and that's the first point of marketing. I'm in there educating them, which is, marketing to the cooks because they have to turn around when I'm not there. I mean, when I show up, they, they make a big deal out of it and it's fun. I wear a big tall chef's hat and the little kids come running out and, and it's great. But what happens the next day when I'm not there? The cooks have to know what they're talking about to be able to sell it instead of, I, you know, I've, it's changed drastically. I remember the first time they're going, they are not going to eat that. And I'm like, you just wait, you wait. And when the kids come through the line, you have to market to them too. So I cook and then I serve and then I go out and sit in the cafeteria with them and talk to them. But sometimes it's about what we call the dish. It, and a lot of the schools will use the, the um, school mascot. So it might be called, oh, I don't know, panther rice, whatever it is, but some little cool thing to get the kids to taste it. And, and that's the thing. We don't always market in traditional forms. So that's kind of some of the things we're going to go through today are the non-traditional forms of marketing. Because we all know we can run ads in magazines and we can print on menus and put up signage, but um, it really does boil down to the education part of it. And particularly with, um, with in schools, certainly with, uh, the, the, with the, the food service staff, your servers in a restaurant, your, um, the, the people cooking at a, at a, um, at a corporate, um, in a corporate situation. They have, to, they have to have the buy-in, so you have to give them that buy-in somehow. Um, whole grains can be, a, pardon the pun, dry subject. Um, so you have to make it exciting. Uh, Maria told a funny um, story that was a new <laughs> story for us about Frika. What I told a different one, um, where, the, where the village finds out that it's about to be, um, it's about to be attacked, so they, they, they cut down all their wheat that's too young to harvest, but they cut it down anyway, and then the, then the horrible invaders come and they burn the, the, the wheat fields and burn the village, and the villagers flee to a nearby wood while this is happening. <laughs> and, and, and then, they, and then they, the terrible people leave and they come back and they say, oh, what are we gonna eat now? And they, and they realize that this, that this lovely grain has been actually preserved and sort of smoked, so it's got this really nice flavor um, and nutritional, nutritionally more important because it was, it was harvested young. So now we have two Frika stories. Right. I, I like I, both of yep. them. Yep, we're going to talk to Maria more about yeah, we're her Frika get, story. But, yeah, that was awesome. You know, and we're going to move on from, from K-12 here, but um, what I loved in a non-traditional form of marketing was the opportunity you had in the Twin Cities. Um, talk a little bit about that. 
Sometimes I'm asked to go into a school, and this is, this is truly what I love to do, go into the school and work with whomever, work with the kids, work with the lunch ladies, work with whomever it is um, to, to get kids eating whole grains. And they asked me, it was a local food day, um, and they asked to, for me to come in and, and promote wheat berries. So they, I pull up and they, they say, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, you're gonna be in this room with a video camera on you and it's gonna be sent to every classroom in the, in the school. And, and then you're gonna go down to the, to the cafeteria while, where we will serve the thing that you just talked about. So, you know, lucky me, right? And I get up there and I say, okay, we're gonna talk about wheat berries. And, you know, I had, I had um, flour for them to, what does what wheat berry make? And it makes flour. And then what does flour make? It makes pasta. What do you like pasta with? Tomatoes and basil, right? So I had made a tomato basil wheat berry salad for them to try. And, and, and that was it, it was a 30 second thing. And then I went down to the cafeteria when the kids were online and they saw me come in and they freaked out because they thought they were watching TV. <laughs> and, and there I was, and it was, it, it was great. And they were, just, they were clamoring around me and asking for, my, asking for my autograph. They had recipes for me to sign. And each one of them ate the salad and loved it. And I said, it's like, tastes like pasta, right? Which it did. So fun stuff like that. Um, I'll go into a, I'm gonna make a, a salad next that is, is <laughs> um, something that I'm very passionate about. Um, and I went into a school in, in Oregon, and I had 65 lunch ladies making these salads with me. And that's the buy-in, that's the marketing that you have to do. You have to get them super excited about something. And when you see the salad I'm gonna make, if you haven't seen it yet, it is super exciting. So I think I'm just gonna go right in and make Perfect. it. Perfect, and I'll uh, kind of fill in the gap here, and you can just interrupt me when you need to. But, okay. but what she was doing was selling to the kids. She was marketing to the kids. She got them excited, for, very non-traditionally, through uh, you know, seeing her on the TV screen. But, um, but that's really what we do. So we move from um, K-12 into colleges and universities. It's kind of the next step, and guess what? Now, we've been doing whole grains in schools long enough that when we go into colleges and universities, they expect to see the whole grains. It's already there, it's already happening, and, and in many cases, They've been eating it for the last four years for, in progressive schools like Boulder. And so we kind of have it a little easier when you come into colleges and universities because they really do, um, their palates are expanding quicker than, honestly, a lot of times the cafeterias are able to keep up with. So, um, and along with the CNU segment, college and university segment, um, they usually have a marketing department that has a little bit of a budget, more so than K through 12 and they're able to put up signage and start to educate kids. Um, we talk about chef tables, and uh, for those that may not know what those are, um, primarily in the, in the corporate feeder um, world is where you see chef tables, but that independence um, also utilize chef tables, and really, it's about companies like us that are willing to put culinary first, we'll go in and we do a chef table, so we're like a guest chef, in the cafeteria, in the dining room, and um, our, our local university, um, Bemidji State University, way uh, almost to the Canadian border, middle of nowhere, um, 5,000 students, they have stir fry night on Thursday night. And I haven't done it in about two years now, but um, I would just go in and replace the brown rice. But then it was someone new, and I would bring quinoa in, and the kids were asking questions, and what are you doing here? That's the first question. And, and then you're, you have that moment where you can talk to them about the grains. And again, we're educating them, and then pretty soon the word spreads throughout, and, and you know, the texting now, you'll, hey, make sure you hit the chef table when you're at the uh, cafeteria tonight. All right, so are you able to see, did they zoom in while I was well, talking? Well, so I've, some, I've misplaced one of my lids, but so here's what this is gonna look like. And has anybody seen this? Does anybody know what this is? <laughs> There's supposed to be another flat lid underneath, the, but it doesn't matter, it's fine. Um, so this is a shaker salad. It's very beautiful, it's very colorful. Um, it happens to be vegan, um, which just really all it, uh, I'm telling you is that it, they're very, very versatile. So on the bottom is, a, is a, um, a, a rice blend with five different rices, a couple of sprouted rices, red rice, um, uh, wild rice. And then we've got um, uh, red bell peppers, 
a layer of cilantro, black beans, and corn. This is a reimbursable meal. That's very important in K-12. It has three of the five items that a child must take in order to be reimbursed by the government. I'm not gonna go into it too much because it gets really complicated, but when food service directors see this, they go, that is a reimbursable grab and go. The kid can, you can menu this with an apple and a, and a milk, and the kid can just take this and get off the line and have a really healthy reimbursable meal. Um, the beans are the protein. We have, two, we have a cup of vegetables and we have a cup of grains, and that's what you need. Um, the beans could be lentils. The beans could be chicken. The beans could be anything. The vegetables can be anything. But as long as you've got a whole grain in there, and it's gotta be, it's gotta be a whole grain, um, there you go. These, um, I developed these for K-12. I stole the, whoops, sorry. I stole the idea from Whole Foods, who stole it from McDonald's. So crazy, right, that McDonald's is now the, the, the source of this. Um, I, go, I go all over the country showing these things because they're so versatile, they're so fun. And um, do we have any doubters about whether it works? Whether I'm gonna be able to shake this? <laughs> There's well, always a doubter in the room, like, show me. Well, I'll doubt, just okay. so I can see it, but. So, uh, so what you do, so there's supposed to be a flat lid on, on top of this, which there is not. It's probably on my kitchen table in San Francisco. So you would take the flat, all the lids off, and here's your dressing. When you're ready to eat it, pour your dressing on. This is a cumin lime olive oil vinaigrette, very simple. I'm putting the domed lid with no hole this is not a Starbucks, because you put your straw in, hold, this is, a, this is a no hole domed lid. I learned early on to hold it like this with four fingers because the first time I presented this to a school, it shot across the room and, and it was beautiful. It was this exact salad. And so imagine these beautiful <laughs> colors, like the rainbow. I was like, oh, there's a rainbow in here. This is great. It was very embarrassing. So. See, I hold them like a, like a martini or well, a margarita. It, you know, you're bold. <laughs> So she loves when people challenge her because she was at another event where uh, the executive chef for a, one of the, we'll just leave it at, one of the largest distributors across the U.S. Oh. doubted and said, there's no way. We have to put, to put that. to put it in a 20-ounce cup. Yeah, That's a 16 yeah. Ounce. And so there was an argument, um, friendly argument, but eventually she proved her point. So now we uh, talk about that as often as we can. And I'm looking at the time and thinking, I'm gonna have to start whipping through some of this information because Are we, we have five okay. minutes before we're supposed to take questions. Okay, so. we're gonna really quickly do our last thing, which is a bowl, um, a bowl concept. And I'm just realizing I only have a small bowl here. Um, that's okay. We, um, it's, I'll, work, I'll work with it, that's fine. The bowl concept, right? Everybody's doing bowls. Chipotle does bowls. Everybody, it's super easy. You, get a, you have, a, you have a, a bunch of ingredients out in front of you. You get to make your choices. Very popular with fast food, very popular with kids. Um, we're seeing it everywhere. Um, and I just want to really briefly um, throw together a bowl, which you are going to taste um, in the reception. This is with um, uh, black and white barley. So I'm just going to heat those up. I may just pretend to heat them up, because we're not going to eat this. Um, this is some balsamic roasted tofu. And I'm going to heat those two up together. So this is our, that's our protein in this bowl. This is all about um, layering, layering textures, layering hot and cold, layering flavors, surprising people with things, making it interesting, right? So barley has that really lovely, chewy, sort of gummy bear uh, texture, which I just love. And so we're just gonna heat that up a little bit and put that in the bottom of the bowl. So now the bottom of the bowl is hot, yay. So that's, that's, gonna, be, that's gonna be the warm part and then and then we're just gonna layer it. I have some arugula that is delicious. I have some fennel, some salted fennel, which is a lovely surprise when it, um, when it gets a little wilty, it's salty, it's got that weird anise flavor that's so delicious. Um, some grape tomatoes, some bacon, okay? Tiny bit of animal protein, not a lot. You don't need a lot. Just a little for flavor. And then, so that now you have some crunch in there. And I have a fen toasted fennel and chili vinaigrette, which we're gonna pour all over the top. So now the whole thing is coming together with this beautiful vinaigrette. It's dripping down through everything. And I'm gonna, t and I'm gonna top it with some fried shallots. So it's all about these crunchy, soft, hot, cold, salty, sweet, sour, spicy, everything going on in one bowl.
and you'll try that later. So the bowls um, are a big part of the chef tables that we're doing. So I mentioned, mentioned those, um, and I'm just going to kind of breeze past. So from colleges and universities to corporate dining and healthcare, healthcare has come an unbelievable long ways since um, just a few years back. And um, we're really seeing heavy marketing into whole grains across all those segments. And the bowl concept is probably the biggest mover right now, along with salads. I mean, the salads are the really easy thing to um, throw out there with it, it. You really can utilize everything you have already in the walk-in cooler. Um, but I want to make sure we talked about independent restaurants because th that's where we started back in 1978, the company started. And, um, you know, they don't have the big marketing departments that some of the corporate feeders do. And they have to rely on their staff and their knowledge. And they don't have time every day to be out there looking up where Frika came from and what they could possibly say about it to interest their diners. And so what we found is the really successful menus are actually, you know, if it's, a, if it's an item that makes it on the menu, you know, permanently, whether that's for they change quarterly, monthly, weekly, whatever it is, if it makes it on the menu, don't just put brown rice, don't put barley. I mean, if it's just brown rice, I guess there's not a lot you can do with that, but... Maybe it's local brown rice. Right, so we talk about, you know, if there's a little bit of a story there, you want to educate those that are out there in the restaurant selling the menu. So at pre-meal with the servers, if it's the special, um, the chef's going to give a little bit of information. Hopefully, the grain has some kind of a story with it. I mean, we love talking about Kamut and how those seeds arrived in America, and Frika is, is, a, is a favorite, certainly. But, but sometimes it's about where it's grown. And, it, and, you know, when the local movement started happening in such a big way, we had, you know, all kinds of calls. Oh, what do you got that's grown in, I don't know, um, Texas? Well, nothing, actually. Uh, we might, some of our long grain rice comes from Texas, but, you know, there's, there's really nothing terribly interesting that, and I'm sure there's interesting crops being grown in Texas. We're just not doing it. So we started to talk about that, um, you know, regionally, if we do a lot of blends, so there, there might be, 10% red rice in there, but that red rice is grown in the Sacramento Valley. So let's, let's talk about some of those grains coming from the Sacramento Valley. People can visualize it, so um, it, it's not so important at that point because they're pairing that with the local ingredients that they're doing. So it's really that blank canvas to, and we like to think of the grains as the stars everywhere, the whole grains, but you know, sometimes, let's face it, it's about the local heirloom tomatoes or a, a small amount of um, animal protein, which Again, huge driving um, force behind reducing um, food costs. And you know, we see the eight ounce sirloin steak going down to four or five ounces, and then they're bumping up with, um, with grains and vegetables on the plate. And I, you know, I used to think eight ounce sirloins were awesome, but now it's just too much. And I don't know, when we go to restaurants and we get to eat together a few times a year, dine together, and um, it's not usually about proteins we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, it's about the sides. So the grains often are on now. You're seeing them on the left-hand side of the menu, so the appetizers. And that you know, is a great way to introduce grains in a non-threatening way. So they can have that little bit of quinoa over there, and they spent $6.95 on that appetizer without you know, risking a $20 um, entree where they were going to be stuck with, if they didn't like it, stuck with all of that quinoa. Um, I was thinking about, outside of independent restaurants, some of the other venues that were starting to see successful whole grains. And I was thinking, Joel, that it was, gosh, a number of years ago now, when you were at Disney, you guys were, you guys were doing this stuff 10 years ago. And yeah, when you go through Disney, it might be difficult to find the whole grains on every corner, but they're there, and they're doing it, and they're doing it successfully. Um, all right. Want to talk about delis and the salads going into delis? Well, yeah, it's, it's again, an endless variety. I, you saw some of Maria's gorgeous uh, recipes. Um, I mean, everybody has their own favorite whole grain recipes, but it's important. <laughs> A, a, a bigger challenge with delis because the person working at the deli probably doesn't really 
have the expertise to tell you what the story is behind or get you to eat them. So, so what do we do? How do we, how do we handle that? Yeah, we had a um, curried basmati salad that some local delis had um, added to the deli case. And, you know, let's face it, they have, they have two shots at this. Well, three, okay? Any signage they put out, how beautiful the product looks, at, and then the person behind the counter hopefully knows one or two things. But let's face it, it's, it's not usually the case, at least not in, well, okay, where I live, it's difficult to, uh, to educate and... Um, it's, you know, good help is hard to find, they say. So, um, but they had this curried basmati salad that just wasn't performing at all, but they sampled it, and then it sold. And as long as they were sampling it, it was selling. People were buying it. And so sampling, obviously, we do whole grain sampling day. That's a big deal. Um, but when they stopped sampling it, it stopped selling. So they actually changed the name of the salad from curried basmati salad to Indian summer salad. That's all it took. So sometimes it's about the name, um, you know, so it's not just kids that we have to be tricky about, not tricky, but creative with the naming of, of the recipes. Yeah, if you've got a menu in front of you and not a picture of the food, you're, you know, you're kind of lost. You're kind of at the, the mercy of whoever wrote that description, so it has to be a good one. So I know we're, <clears throat> we're getting close to just question time, but I have to say, Fast Casual um, is coming a long ways, and I know you had mentioned, um, you know, Panera having the ancient grain bowl they're doing it. Whole grains at Panera, and you also mentioned Chick-fil-A, of all things. I mean, I, sorry, I, I was um, kind of blown away by the fact that they were starting with farro and quinoa, and um, I would have thought maybe some wheat berry thrown in there or some brown rice, but they're just going for it right out of the gate. And I have to add that there are some, a couple large national restaurant chains that I'm working with right now and have been working with for quite some time. It, it can be painful to try to get that big engine to move. They're still not willing to put whole grains on the menu completely. They want to dabble in it a little bit. So they're still using some white rice of some sort. And then quinoa, thankfully, cooks quick, right? So they have a little bit of quinoa in there, and sometimes it's a, a, a pearled wheat berry or whatever it is, but they're not willing to make the jump yet. But it's coming. But I had a call the other day. And the chef wanted to know, oh, can we call that blend super grains? I'm like, yeah, there's like 10% quinoa in there, and that's all you got. That's the only thing you can talk about. But, um, but it is happening. And the last thing, keep an eye on IQF in food service. So indiv individual quick frozen grains is, you know, that's where Chick-fil-A is going to bring in their product is uh, quick frozen. And that's going to really open up um, where you're going to see whole grains. Some questions, comments for Mike and Colleen. Yes, Lexi. Hotels. <laughs> Actually, no, that wasn't my question. Um, you mentioned earlier how um, it's easier in, on college campuses than it is on K-12 campuses. And I'm wondering, in your experience, since you do serve both, if you've seen a change since whole grains have been established as a kind of norm at that elementary middle school and high school level now for a few years, have you seen an effect when you get to a college campus that, okay, like I've been seeing this for years, it's nothing new, I'm more ready for it, does that have an impact as well? Absolutely, it's, um, I say they're starting in, in K through 12, and by the time they get to college and universities, they're not only expecting to see whole grains, but their palates are usually getting a little more adventurous, so they're wanting, ethnic foods um, and ethnic flavors and spicy, bold. You know, the one thing we didn't talk about is um, the one thing you taught me going into K-12 is how you compensate for sodium in the dishes. And that's big, bold Big, bold acids. flavors, acids, herbs, spices. Just hit them with every other flavor you can think of to make it interesting. Which compensates for the lower sodium. But um, from colleges and universities, when they graduate, then they move into the corporate world. And, and many of them are in those corporate cafeterias. And again, it's just a natural transition, I think. And, and we're lucky to be a part of that because it's, it's getting easier and easier to, for those that are using whole grains and are starting to be a little more adventurous. Um, it's really fun to see what they're, they're putting out. Yeah, we started in 2012 with the, with the guidelines that changed in schools. So it's, it's going to be a generation soon that will just be like, yeah, what's white rice? 
you know? It's that stuff that I get at home sometimes still, because they're not getting it in schools. So my name is Ken Vickerstaff. I'm with Bow and Arrow Foods. Um, we have 10,000 acres in southwest Colorado, and uh, we grow non-GMO corn. Uh, we have over 7,700 acres. Um, I myself have been in the organic food industry for about 40 years. So it, it, how do you scale from whole grain? Um, when I ran Muir Glen, it was pretty easy to get executive chefs to talk about number 10 tins of organic tomatoes. It took a while. We had budget. We had dollars. How in particular with whole grain where it's ingredient oriented, do you make your way into commerce? Do you enter this food service world? Obviously, chef exposure is great, but it, it doesn't put 25 pound bags or 50 pound bags of cornmeal into institutional recipes. How, how do you weave that path in particular when you don't have national recognition or millions of dollars of consumer budgets? So um, our outside sales team would say brokers. Get brokers that um, don't carry a similar line and maybe start with your own region. Just test the waters with your own region and um, find out if they can, you know, hit those, ask for their top five accounts, top five volume movers, and then go in with them. Do the ride along with um, the broker rep and you go in and you see what the opportunities are, see if you can meet their price points. If you can get them to menu that, then the distributors will look at you and they need X amount of cases moved a week. And what we've done is say, you know what, we'll guarantee that. And so, and now we're still far from coast to coast distribution, but um, we get the accounts that, you know, give us a verbal, yeah, we're gonna use it and we'll use it for whatever, the next six months. And then it's our job, we have an internal sales team that will make phone calls, connect the dots, get others, they'll, hey, guess what? We have Frica stocked in Montana, whatever it is, Cisco, Montana. And um, we start to build on that, and then the reps start building on it. And once it, you know, they start talking about it, one rep, all it takes is one rep to have success, and they start talking about it, and then pretty soon, you know, it spreads. But it, it's, it takes a long time. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it's... And the team of chefs really helps. Because nobody can bring a grain or a corn to light the way chefs can. Additional questions? Anybody else? I think they all saw this great food and they know there's a reception happening next door. And why would you ask questions when you could go eat this and really believe it all? Um, Sarah, did you wanna? Okay, I'll just finish up here. So we have this reception going on next door and I wanna say a big thank you to all our opening session speakers. Let's start with thanking Mike and Colleen. There are great stories up here on the stage, but I think there is a story in every seat in this room. One of the things that I always like about our conferences every other year is that you are all the speakers. You are sitting there in that reception. You've got a story to tell. You've got some information that's going to help the next person. And this is all about exchanging and networking this information. It's just such a key part of this conference. So we're inviting you to go next door to Avedon CD, where you can get acquainted with your fellow conference attendees and enjoying some wonderful hors d'oeuvres and a refreshing beverage or two. There is an open bar over there. Just um, heading up for tomorrow, we will have... Breakfast again next door from 7.30 to 8.30, and then we will meet back here at 8.30 a.m. sharp to hear our first speaker, Stephen Jones, from the Bread Lab. Thank you, everybody. Now, on to the reception. Um, question here, can we leave our bags in here? Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that you can get back into the room afterwards so that you can enjoy. Thank you.